A reading from Deuteronomy. Moses said to all Israel the words which the Lord commanded him. See, I have set before you today life and prosperity, death and adversity. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I am commanding you today by loving the Lord your God, walking in his ways, and observing his commandments, decrees, and ordinances, then you shall live and become numerous, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to possess. But if your heart turns away and you do not hear, but are led astray to bow down to other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall perish. You shall not live long in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Choose life so that you and your descendants may live long, loving the Lord, your God, obeying him, and holding fast to him. For that means life to you and length of days so that you may live in the land that the Lord swore to give to your ancestors, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Hear what the Spirit of the church, hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. The psalm today is Psalm 1. Please read responsibly by whole verse. Happy are they who have not walked in the counsel of the wicked, nor lingered in the ways of sinners, nor sat in the seats of the scornful. Their delight is in the law of the Lord, and they meditate on his law day and night. They are like trees planted by streams of water, bearing fruit in due season, with leaves that do not wither. Everything they do shall prosper. It is not so with the wicked. They are like chaff. Therefore, the wicked shall not stand upright when judgment comes, nor the sinner in the counsel of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked is doomed. The second reading is from the book of Philemon. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and co-worker, to Aphia, our sister, to Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. When I remember you in my prayers, I always thank my God because I hear of your love for all the saints and your faith toward the Lord Jesus. I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective when you perceive all the good that we may do for Christ. I have indeed received much joy and encouragement from your love, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you, my brother. For this reason, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do your duty, yet I would rather appeal to you on the basis of love, and I, Paul, do this as an old man, and now also as a prisoner of Christ Jesus. I am appealing to you for my child, Onesimus, whose father I have become during my imprisonment. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to both you and to me. I am sending him, that is, my own heart, back to you. I wanted to keep him with me so that he might be of service to me in your place during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I prefer to do nothing without your consent, in order that your good deed might be voluntary and not something forced. Perhaps this is the reason that he was separated from you for a while, so that you might have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has wronged you in any way or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will repay it. I say nothing about your owing me, even your own self. 
Yes, brother, let me have this benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I am writing to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Luke. Now large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and he turned and said to them, Whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even life itself, cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not first sit down and estimate the cost to see whether he has enough to complete it. Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it will begin to ridicule him, saying, this fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to wage war against another king, will not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to oppose the one who comes against him with 20,000. If he cannot then, then the other one is still far away. He sends a delegation and asks for the terms of peace. So therefore, none of you can become my disciple if you do not give up all of your possessions. The Gospel of the Lord. name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. So I want to pick up on that theme of the tea leaf strainer this morning, because there probably aren't more powerful words that strain us than the words of today's gospel. Think on these things. Whoever comes after me and does not hate his father or mother, wife or children, brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life itself cannot be my disciple. He says this to this crowd full of people, a stadium full that started to follow him around. In terms of popularity, Jesus was going through the roof. Do you think this dealt a death blow to some of that? I mean, those who listened to him seriously, unless you hate your father and your mother, your wife and children, brothers and sisters, Yes, even your own life itself, you cannot be my disciple. You talk about pulling the rug right out from underneath a kind of a really good party that was just beginning to happen. Now, it might be argued that Jesus overstated his case. It might be argued that he intentionally threw the cat among the pigeons just to stir everybody up and get them thinking. Then again... It might be argued for those who genuinely seek to follow Jesus, those who are serious about allowing him to be who he says he is in our lives, it demands a significant countercultural move. It flips things right upside down. And as much as he actually doesn't say hate, the Greek says, unless you love less, your father and your mother. So he's prioritizing. What he is really saying in a culture that valued family um, over everything else is that family needs to actually take second place. And And it's very challenging to a culture that was placing such a high priority to family. So Jesus even flipped that way of thinking upside down. This is also precisely what Paul was trying to do in his letter to Philemon. So I'm going to need three volunteers here for a minute. Jackie, I need you because you volunteered this morning to dance, and you don't need to dance, but I need you. Uh, I need Rick, how about you come on up here, and Judy, you too. How's that? Okay, Jackie, I need you to stand right down there. And Rick, I need you to stand right up over there, and Judy right up here. So for a midget, now this could be a stretch on, no, you stay down there, thank you. <laughs> this, this could be a stretch on your imagination, but I need you to work with me, 
Okay? So for the time being, this is Philemon. Okay? This is Onesimus, Philemon's slave. Indenture. She has no right to make any opinion on her own. She does not know what time to go to bed in the morning unless Philemon tells her. She has no right to decide what she's going to eat unless Philemon tells her. She has no right to a life on her own because indentured pe persons in this era wear 100%, not 90, not 85, but 100% at the disposal of the person who owned them. For the time being, you're Paul. Okay? So it seems that Onesimus ran away from Philemon. So, Jackie, you need to go over there. Thank you. You told you were going to dance. It's, it's only, only just begun. So Onesimus runs away from Philemon, and by law, Philemon has the right, should Onesimus ever be returned, to incarcerate Onesimus or to have Onesimus put to death. Those are the two options. Seems that Onesimus, on his journey in flight from his Philemon, hap chance runs into Paul who is incarcerated for the gospel, and while in jail, Paul is responsible for Onesimus' transformation. Onesimus comes into a new understanding of the life-transforming gospel of Christ and becomes a faithful servant because he is so excited about what God did for him, he becomes a faithful servant to Paul. Now, Paul writes back this very short epistle to Philemon, writes a letter to Philemon, and, and explains the transformation in Onesimus, and then this is where the rubber hits the road. This is where it becomes countercultural. Sends Onesimus back to Philemon with a letter asking, this is the dance, asking that Philemon not just accept Onesimus back. Now I need you to come up the two steps. Not just accept Onesimus back as a slave, but accept Onesimus back on equal footing, equal standing. Now you see, it's one thing to accept Onesimus back as a slave. But actually, Paul challenges Onesimus to follow the admonition of Jesus which is quite countercultural, and the admonition of Jesus is a created person is of equal value, not lesser value. Okay, you can all go back to your seats. Thank you. I just wanted to point this out because you all did a good job. <laughs> because the temptation, it would, the temptation of Philemon would have been to accept Onesimus back and pat Onesimus on the back and say, I forgive you for running away, go get my shoes. I forgive you for running away, I'd like hot, hot dinner tonight, not cold one. Because that's our propensity. Oftentimes our forgiveness is um, a paternalistic forgiveness that still allows us to think better of ourselves than we ought. Um, and to think a little less than somebody else. See, sociologically, every culture, every class of people have those they look down on. Every culture has a tendency to want to think themselves feeling just a little bit better than someone else. And it may be uh, a decision based on race, or religion, or lifestyle, or gender, or clothing choices, or tattoos, or we all have criteria that we are prone to judge others by. And when Jesus challenged his listeners that we need to be loving all of those things less than our love for God, He's really saying we now need to look at life through a new lens. We need to look at Onesimus as equal, not the same but lesser. 
can see by the look on some of your eyes that you, you understand what I'm getting at. I remember preaching on this passage from Philemon and our inherent biases, because the, I think that's the term I may have used back then, or our inherent prejudices. Um, and it was September the 9th, 2001, when the lectionary had these very same readings. And I suggested humbly that we all have prejudicial lenses that we look at the world through, and as a result, we lump people in different groups and we, we judge them accordingly. And one woman tore a strip off me uh, that I'm glad I learned that lesson because I've subsequently had a strip torn off me a few other times. But one woman tore a strip off me in the narthex that Sunday morning uh, announcing with clarity that as a follower of Jesus there's no one that she's pre prejudicial toward. Uh, and um, I was wrong to even suggest that on September the 9th, 2001 my second last sermon in that church, by the way, because before the next Sunday rolled around, she had phoned and made an appointment to apologize because she, re she realized that the events of September the 11th, 2001, evidenced to her her racial and religious prejudice prejudices. And how quick she was to jump to judgment on a whole community of people because of the radical, inappropriate behavior of a very few. Did I heave a sigh of relief that she came and apologized? No. But I was grateful that she had the wherewithal to examine her heart and realize the sin that lie within it. See, Paul challenges the very fabric of a culture when he sends Onesimus back to Philemon. He challenges the very fabric that the culture was built on. It was built on this inequity. And the gospel eliminates all inequity and calls us to one. There is one God and Father of all, Paul will write in another epistle. And the struggle that Philemon had, some would call it Philemon's problem, was does he respond in grace and mercy to Onesimus and accept him as a full-fledged brother in Christ? Or does he welcome him back home with a moderate forgiveness, but continue to stand two steps higher than him in an act of judgment. The gospel demands of us the courage to examine our hearts. The gospel demands that we be honest about what's there. The scriptures are quite clear that God the Holy Spirit can only change those who are courageous enough to be honest. I hate to use this uh, because it demeans God, but the Holy Spirit is a genuine gentleman. He doesn't force himself on anyone but for the open and the transparent and the honest, God the Holy Spirit cooperates with the willing spirit and transforms. You see, I've said this a number of times, but I will repeat myself just for the sake of understanding. When we accept Christ as Savior, our position immediately changes. We become one with God, we become an inheritor of the kingdom of God and part of the family of God, and our position has changed. We've gone from outside the kingdom to inside the kingdom. We've gone from enemy of God to friend of God. We, we, our position has changed, but our condition 
still needs a lot of work. Well, yours may not, but mine does. Because there are a lot of old ways of thinking that I need to die to. There are a lot of old cultural standards that still often lay claim to my life that I need to acknowledge and then die to. Unless I hold my life itself as less important than my love for God, I'm not fit to be part of the kingdom of God. Whoever does not carry his cross to death and follow me cannot be my disciple. My condition needs to be regularly acknowledged and put to death. The old propensity to wander, as the hymn goes, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love, doesn't change my position with Christ but it certainly compromises my circumstance. circumstance. And that's the struggle that Philemon had. He had to wrestle through and die to the cultural norms. What would his friends say if he starts hanging around with Onesimus as a brother? They'd start judging him. They might marginalize him. They might not invite him to the party. On, that was the struggle that Onesimus or that Philemon had. And Paul said this to him. Paul said, I could command you to accept him as a brother. I could command it. Then you do it out of duty. I want you to do it out of newfound love. The struggle we have as followers of Jesus are epitomized, I believe, by Philemon's struggle. And Philemon, like you and I, need to own our prejudices. We have to recognize the, the cultural norms that we have chosen to accept as acceptable, and we need to be courageous enough to die to them. And let our love for Jesus trump. Paul was clear on this, and the challenge should you choose to accept it, is to listen to the words and, like Philemon, be willing to turn your own cultural standards over and live by the new standard of Jesus.